welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. It's a killer day because we, we've got Mr. Michael Hawley in the room. That's right. It is, uh, it's not so much Jack the Ripper day, but it's uh, serial killer day, so I'm all excited about this. Yeah, anytime we got murder in the room, murder in the house, we've got Mr. Hawley. Cause, you know, you that is correct. Yeah, that's I'm correct. just dying to see you here. Yeah, well, you know, I, I've been I've been watching Perry Mason all day, getting ready for this interview, because um, we are talking to a uh, I, what can I say? He's the he's the man of the uh, crime world. He's not the crime committer, of course. He's like the prosecutor world. New book out, The Book of Murder. Matt Murphy, thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. So, Matt, like you've been around, and I, <laughs> I don't mean that in a cheap yeah. way. I mean that as. <laughs> Uh, but uh, looking back at your life, like looking at sitting right now, and you got this book, and you've had this quite this career. When you look back at it, did you see this all happening the way it's played out for you for yourself when you started? Oh gosh, well I, you know, I started. Geez, I'm gonna I'm gonna age myself by saying this, but I was a I was a junior law clerk in 1992, and that really was before the whole true crime world uh, took off. And so I never thought, um, you know, that there would ever be so much interest in, in what, I, what I chose for profession. I was fascinated by it. I couldn't get enough that I was a complete junkie on my own. But um, it seems like a... It seems like, oh, Jay Simpson times, huh? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I watched <laughs> that. And I, I, I watched that as a baby DA. And I, the verdict came back. I was in court that day, and the judge brought me back. Uh, there was a guy named uh, old Judge Wilkerson brought me back into his chambers to watch the OJ verdict come in. And I wound up trying a murder case against Christopher Darden when he was a defense lawyer. Nice, nice man. We got along great. Uh, same result for him as OJ. He was a big loss for his side. But, yeah, I, ne I never thought that um, I'd ever see a day where there was so much public fascination with this stuff. But I'm fascinated by it, so um, I'm glad everybody else is too. But you know, with that, um, you know, with OJ and and I and I've had uh, Marsha Clark and and all that crew on. We we've, we've talked about all this stuff. You know, the whole the whole scenario. And I always say that with all of this press and all of the media and and hoopla going on about this stuff, it's got to affect the way you perform your job when you're being watched and you're being talked about, especially a case like that one where, you know, every day you go in, oh, she's got a new hairdo. Oh, look what she's wearing today. Yeah. That, that's got, I, you see, because, you know, I'm, I'm used to it. I do a lot of stuff in the public because that's what I chose and that's what I do. It's still got its moments where I'm, I'm, I go crazy with some of it. But to do that and to, do, to be on performance, be watched, you know, the cases on CNN, you have thousands of people watching, and every word and everything you do, they have to make a comment. How do you, you know, even yourself, how do you get over something like that? How can you, how can it not affect you? Well, the first couple of times you, you do a case, and OJ was unique to this day as far as the, the amount of media attention on that, right? So, but but I did I did plenty of plenty of big high profile cases, and the first one or two, it's it's in your head constantly, and then after you get a couple of them under your belt, you realize that it's just another component. And you're, it's, you, you, get, you get used to it, and in a way, I'll tell you what, when you stand up, you know, and I, I've done, it feels like I've done a million, I've probably done 20 closing arguments where I'm mic'd up, where there's a camera in the courtroom, and they're, they're literally, for national TV, they're filming every word. And the first, the first time I did it, it was exactly what you were saying, it was nerve-wracking. And then after that, you, you forget the mic is even on five minutes after you start. You're a little nervous at first, but you got a job to do. And um, a lot of those cases took so many years to come together. And in a weird way, you just sort of get used to it. And then you, you know, part of the trick is you got to you got to make the, sure the jury isn't being distracted. You know, I, I think there were a lot of lessons learned with OJ. Um, I think a lot of the judges learned a lot. And I, I had, man, every murder I did was in front of an excellent judge. And I, I tried 52 in the unit. Um, when I was in homicide, 52 different jury trials, and they were, I had I had one good judge after another, and oftentimes the same judges in Orange County because they were called long cause judges. But you do you get surprisingly used to it um, pretty quick. But Southern California though is uh, they have a lot of good defense lawyers too. That must be real tough too. That's the hard part. Yeah, it's like you. 
on some of those cases, man, I, you, you get these lawyers. It's, you know, it's a little bit like um, a game of roulette. You file a case as a prosecutor. You have no idea who the, who the defendant is going to hire. You know, and I, and I talk about this a little in the book. Some days it's a frumpy dude with thick glasses who smells weird. And others, you know, the, the family will hire a true hitter. And there's a lot of them. Like you said, you know that in Southern California, there are some of the best criminal defense lawyers in the world, I think. And, uh, man, when one of those guys walks in, you never know who it's going to be. And they show up for the arraignment. And a lot of times you'll have multiple arraignments, you know, going on in the same courtroom. And you see some of these people walk in. It's like, oh, please don't be on my case. Please don't be on my case. And for me, they almost always were on my case. And, um uh, but you know, it's like it's like anything else. You know, uh, I just heard an analogy this morning. If you want to, you want to be a good tennis player, you always have to play with somebody who's better than you. And that was, uh, especially as a young prosecutor, that's how you learn. You go up against really good defense lawyers, and um, sometimes, you know, especially in, in misdemeanors, um, you you just get your teeth kicked in by some of these lawyers, and you you, you really do learn more from the ones you lose, and. So, so that when you're actually up there in the big leagues doing the doing the high profile murder cases, you've hopefully learned those lessons and you stop losing. Um, so that's kind of the name of the game. How, how did you select the? Uh, it looks like you've got a dozen cases in this book, the Book of Murder. Uh, out of out of those fifty two, how did you pick twelve? Yeah, so I wanted to go chronologically. I wanted to take the readers the reader through sort of. I wanted to share my process, you know, because when I showed up in Homestead. I came from four years in sexual assault, and I'd been I'd been a deputy DA for eight years at that point. So four years through the, the you know misdemeanor rotations and and juvenile court, where you learn the the foundation of you know the craft of, of jury trials. And then in Orange County, they do what's called felony panel, where you all you do is you just try generic felonies, like you know. With, so there's a non-specialized felony. So it's like drug dealing and, you know, maybe some, uh, you know, fourth-time DUIs. And you just do – I did 24 felony jury trials in one year. And that's – and it's almost like a draft. So for me, I wanted to take – by the time I got to homicide, I knew nothing about murders, really. And so I wanted to take the reader through my step-by-step -step learning process. And at the same time, I wanted to give examples of the different kinds of murders that you see. So I, I started out – First chapter was a Russian mob hit, so I talked about gang murders in that first chapter, and then I, you know, I had some some child, a uh, bunch of child abuse cases, and I, I talked about the Samantha Runyon case, and then um, you know, so I wanted to kind of do a taxonomy of the different kinds of murder cases that you encounter, and you know, and I did it sort of in a chronological order, but yeah, I've got a ton more that I, you know, I, I want to write about, and I, we're already putting together a proposal for book number two, and, and I think the next one I'm really going to try to focus on um, on serial killers because it's a it's a fascinating topic, and they are they are I mean just they're intriguing in so many ways for me. Right. Speak it specifically, Rodney Alcala. <laughs> that's yeah, that's Rodney. the yeah. one really interesting. My boy, Rock and Rodney, yeah. So Rodney James Alcala, um, Anna Kendrick has her movie coming out. She is wonderful, by the way. Uh, she let me consult with her. I, I've got my assistant, um, you know, some some people have people. I have person. I have one person in my law firm that uh, that works for me. And she called me, and she's like, um, Anna Kendrick is on the phone. I would like to talk to you about a movie she's made. So um, she couldn't have been nicer or more professional. And so she's got a... A movie coming out called Woman of the Hour about you know it's based on it's not it's not verbatim factual but parts of it are are, are exactly what he did and it's about Rodney O'Call. So Rodney O'Call was a he was a he had a genius level IQ. He grew up in in East LA um, with a family who loved him, clean house. Um, brother went to West Point and became a war hero in Vietnam. This guy had every advantage in life. He's a Varsity Letterman at Cantwell High School, which is a really good high school and uh, college prep school in East L.A. Uh, had girlfriends. He was on the yearbook committee, went to UCLA film school, and uh, at night he was one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. Um, and uh, he was uh, kidnapped an 8-year-old girl named Tally Shapiro in 1968 in Hollywood and raped her within an inch of her life. A good Samaritan saw that called it in in the olden days of pay phones that we remember. Um, and there was a, a, a LAPD officer, Officer Camacho, who 
this guy got shot in Vietnam, came back from war, um, became a, a Los Angeles police officer, got shot in the in the Watts riots, and, he, and then he his first day back at work, he gets this welfare check from this good Samaritan, and it didn't look right. A little girl gets into this man's car, and then the man drove her to his house, and the, this good Samaritan uh, and Donald Hines followed this whole thing, and Camacho showed up and kicked the door in, and Alcala went running out the back door, and it was like chase the bad guy or save the little girl, and she was absolutely brutalized. She, there was a, a barbell over her throat, and um, she was in a coma for 32 days, but he saved her, and Alcala got out the back, got to New York, uh, went to NYU film school. He had a, under an alias, and they, they caught him a couple years later working at an all-girls sleepaway camp in Vermont, and he had a of course, multiple victims in New York City that we learned later. But they extradited him to California. He was convicted. He got a life sentence. This was in the old indeterminate sentencing days in California. So this is like early 1970s. He was paroled after 34 months in state prison, um, having kidnapped and almost murdering an 8-year-old. And when they got into his, uh, his little Hollywood bungalow, um, where they found his student ID and all the rest of the stuff, they found hundreds and hundreds of photographs of young women, girls, and young boys in positions of vulnerability that, you know, were, you know, like in rooms alone with Alcala or out in the forest with Alcala or isolated beaches with Alcala, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things. And, yeah, he was, he was a scary, scary guy. Um, so after he was released from California State Prison, you know, the, my lead investigator, who is now an excellent Superior Court judge, you know, he's estimated that if you if you do the math and you look at he's given permission to drive across country and we know he committed five murders in New York for sure, probably one in Texas. He was charged with another one in Wyoming that he definitely did. Um, he was cleared to one in Marin County, suspected of a couple in San Diego. Um, and then we had R5, uh, you know, he probably murdered 100 people after he was released from California State Prison, which, of course, was a shameful mistake by the California Board of Prison. Terms the CDC really blew that one. Yeah, there there were a lot of uh, mistakes made during that whole process, right through. Oh yeah, it's maddening to me. It, it, it fires me up every time I think about it. Like how many how many people had to combine in, in just gross incompetence for that guy to be able to, to kill all those innocent folks? And I, I it, you know, I've, I've gotten in trouble for saying this before because I. I I, I worked on 13 different serial killers during my time in uh, Orange County in the 17 years I was in homicide. And, you know, a lot of them target sex workers. And um, so the way I've portrayed this before, I, I've, I've had people that have gotten mad at me. You know, like Jack the Ripper targeted sex workers. And it's, um, it is, uh, it's a very, like, if you are a, if, if you're into that as a serial killer and that's what you're doing, because of the nature of that, of that profession, um, they, you know, they put those women will put themselves into positions of vulnerability. And that's why it's, it's been that way, for probably going back to ancient Rome. But w the people that Alcala would target were not sex workers. He would, he would find women at restaurants or on the street, and he would use this thing because he was a professional photographer and say, I'd love to take your picture. You're a model. You're beautiful. And that was his way of doing it. So he was. The people that he was targeting, um, like our LA victims, one was a woman in Georgia Wickstead, who was, she was a pediatric cancer nurse, you know, like salt of the earth contributing to the world and, um, you know, a family that loved her. And Charlotte Lamb was a, was a, a legal secretary when they were still called secretaries. Um, Jill Barkham was an 18 year old kid who came out from New York wanting to be an actress in Hollywood. So it was, each one of these, the, the families of those victims, after we after we charge them with all those cases, you get to know the families really well, and it just was so heartbreaking knowing that that guy should have been in prison, and and, and they released him. Um, it's just, uh, it's kind of maddening. It sounds like that was part of his challenge and excitement is is to uh, trap people that aren't usually trapped, like sex workers. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that was it. He was a true predator. Like, he followed a couple of these women. There's a, a place here in L.A. called Brennan's. It's still there. It's on, uh, it's on uh, Lincoln Boulevard in Venice. And it's, they have these famous turtle races where they have these little turtles, and they'll, they'll dump them in a ring. They dump, dump them out, and they, the first turtle to the ring wins the race. And anyway, 
she, uh, Georgia Wickstead went to the turtle races, and we think I'll call a followed her home from that. You know, and he, he's same thing, another a computer programmer named Jill Parento, uh, who may have been his final victim. She was uh, uh, at a place called the Handlebar Saloon in Pasadena, and same thing, was seen talking to a guy that looked a little bit like Alcala, and um, certainly was him, we, we proved later, but um, yeah, followed her home. So it was like, you know, it's like our moms, our sisters, our, our friends, you know, they were, he was targeting women that were um, all loved by somebody, you know, which tragically, you know, isn't always the case for every every poor sex worker out there. Like when I go through a case and write and you meet a lot of people and you talk to a lot of people and you go through the time, and that um, it's it's very um, it, it, it's something that's challenging to go through. How, so how does this whole process change you? Like when you look at yourself, because I know a lot of the book is about this as well. What it's like to go through these things uh, in a in your situation. What's the easiest way you could describe how it's changed you? Gosh, that's a that's a great question. Um, the the real stress of that job, you, you know, we would. So Orange County utilizes what's called a vertical system, which means, you know, a lot of DA's offices, like the, the police investigate, and it, they put the, the police reports on one DA's desk who determines charges, and then it goes to another DA for um, the preliminary hearing, and then another for pretrial negotiations, and then finally it lands on the trial attorney's desk. Orange County, um, for the vertical units, you get a patch of the county. So I have Newport, Coast Mesa, Laguna, and Irvine. Those are my cities, and they're automatically, any murder that happens or any homicide is automatically mine. So I would go out in the middle of the night. I would actually go to the crime scenes uh, before they move the bodies most of the time um, to assist with warrants or whatever, but it's yours from the very beginning, and you follow it all the way up. So you work with the same detectives over and over again. And for me, you know, you see some horrific things. Um, I mean, I've seen things that you, you, or you couldn't imagine, uh, or you guys probably both could, but maybe your audience couldn't. But what really gets to you isn't, you know, the, the horror or the gore, believe it or not. That gets very clinical very quickly. What, gets, what got to me, at least, was the, the enormity of the responsibility. You know, you see a human being that is on a kitchen floor with a, you know, a knife sticking out of her back or in a ditch or on, a, on some autopsy table. You know, and, and then you meet the mom. And I don't know what it was because was, a lot of them had, you know, dads in the picture too or brothers and sisters, but something about those, those moms just got to me. And you have this, you know, uh, some cases are you got you got all the evidence you could ever want. You got to, some of them are on video every once in a while. Some of them you got a great witness. Some of them you got a, you know, whole history of enmity between them or DNA. But some of them are pretty tough, and what what got to me more than anything was the enormity of the responsibility for that family. Because if I blow it, or if I make some mistake and I lose the case, um, man, the, the only thing worse than losing a loved one is losing a loved one to murder. And the only thing worse than losing a loved one to murder is when the killer gets away with it. And, you know, a lot of people have a hard time relating to what a family goes through and, and, and less God forbid they wind up in that situation themselves, you know? Um, so that's what, that's what really got to me, man. I, I stopped sleeping, um, you know, uh, wake up at two in the morning, you know, imagining every, everything on a case that hasn't been done yet. You know, did I make sure the defense had every piece of possible exculpatory evidence or, you know, I, you know, I would, I would stress about that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I work with great people, too, that sort of help me get through that. Um, but it, it definitely hard, hardens your heart a bit. Jibber kind of uh, almost butt heads with uh, detectives thinking they're convinced that we could prosecute this, and you're saying it's just not ready yet? Or uh, was that a battle? No, that is a, that is a part of being a prosecutor. And, th and that's a part that really doesn't – nobody seems to know that part of the job. Um, like – you know, there you will often have cases where you know there's 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 kind of three different categories. There's the the who done it, where you got a you got a murder, and the whole thing is trying to figure out who who the who the killer is. Then you've got the what is it, you know, and and those are the cases where you know exactly who did it. The question is, was it a first degree murder? Was there financial gain involved? Was it a second degree murder? Was it a self defense case? So there's that's probably the most common type of trial you do because a lot of times the you know the person who 
who wants to be a whodunit and they get caught, then they'll quickly spin into, well, I did it because they threatened me, or you know what I mean? But then there's kind of the, the third category, the case that you review as a prosecutor, and that is the one where, man, you know who did it, but the question is, is there enough to take a run at them? And you have, as a, as a prosecutor, you have a responsibility. You know, you have an ethical obligation that you, first of all, you personally have to be subjectively convinced beyond all doubt that that the person's good for it. You can't enter, you, it can't be a case that you entertain any actual doubt. You must subjectively believe to every cell in your body that that person did it. And then the part two is you have to be convinced that you have enough evidence to prove it to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's that's a very subjective call. And and that and the, the calculus changes as you get more experience and you do more and more of them. Like for no body cases, for example, first one of those, I, I had no idea how, it, how juries perceived that or how they saw it. And I, I was, you know, I didn't think, you know, I, I mean, I was really kind of sketched out. And it was a case that somebody else had tried, and it came back as a reversal. And it was only after I really got into it, it's like, okay, we don't, we don't really need a body. And then you see a jury. And, and honestly, guys, juries don't care. They really don't. They, they don't want the killer to get the benefit of successfully disposing of some poor murder victim's remains, you know. And, and you learn that with experience. So, so yeah, you, you have that, you have that headbutting thing with quite a few cops. But for me, it was mostly respectful. And, and, and by the end of my, my tenure on homicide, it was, I, it was always respectful because I was dealing with, Detectives that I've been in the trenches with for almost two decades, and you know, but but also you reach a point in your career where you want to take you want to take runs at the really hard ones that nobody else wants to do, and it's almost like a, it's almost like an addiction, like any good addiction, you know, you you need more and more to get the same high, and in the addictive quality of doing cold case murders, um, you know, that's you go for tougher and tougher cases, and then. You win a few hard ones, and you get the respect of the detectives, and that sort of pushback and the headbutting, you know, that 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 ends um, after just the first couple of years in homicide. And plus, I just I liked my a lot of my detectives so much; it was always very respectful. You know, when the O.J. murders occurred, that was that DNA was so new that it, it almost was not effective at the moment. And it sounds like you were right around that time when DNA was still. Kind of questioned in a way. Yeah, no, that they used to call that RFLP, and I did, I did training with the FBI in San Francisco. I did a big, it was like I think it was a five day program where they trained us about RFLP right before the technology advanced to the profiler and profiler system. So the the RFLP for your listener is that those old gel things with the with the black dashes. Remember that, like the dark, you know, it was like the they'd they'd squish it in with that was the old that was the old way they did. They did forensic DNA, and that was the, the OJ DNA. Now they use a, a, a kit. I think they have 20, 21 different locations. So now it's, uh, it comes out on a graph, and it's, it's a, for my money, it is a lot more convincing, and it's a lot easier to explain for a jury. And, yeah, we, I, I, I really got to ride the, the advancement of forensic technology um, through my time in sexual assault and then homicide. It was 21 years. And, by you know, after you do a few contested DNA cases, you really kind of learn how to how to present that in a way that a jury can can get. And you know, I, I compared my book to a um, like a cat video on Instagram. You know, like when you really think about it, um, the technology that goes into some silly you know like prank video that we watch on our cell phones. You think about the technology of the cell phone. And then all, like, how all that works, I have no clue what goes into that, you know. But I know a cat video when I see it, you know. Um, DNA works kind of the same way. It's like the, the biochemistry that has gone into, you know, DNA and, you know, the, the loci and the alleles and all that is impossibly complex. But a jury's job really is just to look at it and, and say, well, hey, what's on the video? Is this a cat? Is this a hippo? Is this a panda? You know, and it's it's different. You know, like it, it, like juries don't need a master's degree in forensic science to understand, you know, the complexities of DNA to to get how how easy it is when you look at that graph and you say this defendant's DNA matches to a certainty of mathematical absurdity. You know, like 
I think the, the last DNA case I did, the numbers were up to 1 in 17 quadrillion, and there's a, a, a million billion in a quadrillion. And, you know, it's like the, you know, the numbers just become, you know, you can't, they're so high you can't even wrap your head around it. And, yeah, it's, it's, I'm fascinated by DNA, though, and, and the forensic application of it. And that's one part that I really did enjoy and have a lot of fun educating juries on how it works because, if I can understand it, trust me, with my mathematical lameness, anybody can get it, if I can get it. And um, so it was a lot of fun kind of educating people in those DNA cases. It, it, do, you, do you find in, um, there's, there's more teamwork with defense and uh, prosecutors and lawyers at just trying to find out what really happened in a case? And that's a great question. The, it's important for everybody to remember, the defense attorney's job is really not necessarily to find out the truth. You know, their job is to advocate on behalf of their client. Um, and when the when things are working correctly, and m most of the time they really are, um, you've got detectives who are doing, you know, they're doing the right thing. They're working hard to figure it out. And you've got a prosecutor who's making sober, non-emotional charging decisions and it's fundamentally backed by evidence that a judge you know signs off on and approves in the preliminary hearing and most of the time by you get by the time you get to trial especially when you're when you're dealing with professionals that are allowed to specialize like like we were in orange county um you um you know the defense should be defending somebody who's guilty of sin so it's the defense lawyer's job to make sure that um you know they're advocating zealously on behalf of their client but they're not necessarily in the, in, the, in the business of finding out the truth. But as far as teamwork goes, most of the time when you're dealing, there are a lot of really good, solid public defenders, uh, at least in Orange County, and, and I think everywhere, that, you know, they're not ideological. They're there to do the job of advocating for their client, and you really do have a, most of the time, a really positive working relationship, understanding that their job is to do everything they can, but, you know, to uh, put you to the test as a prosecutor. And, um, you know, most of the time, you know, juries are very good at sorting that out. When, this, when everybody's doing their job, the system tends to work far more often than not. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in it. Most jurors really are good and they want to get it right. And there's certainly plenty of examples where it goes off the rails. But, um, you know, most of the time, as they say, that, that plane lands safely. So, but, yeah, as far as cordial working relationship, I... I only had one lawyer in all my years that I, I didn't want to shake his hand at the end. But uh, the rest, I always made it a point to, to reach over and shake hands and, um, you know, and try to make it as professional as, as I could. So, do you, so any regrets? Boy, um, <laughs> I, yeah, okay, so I never had kids and I never got married. And I, um, I really, I never had the mental bandwidth myself. I had colleagues that... I just, I, I'm, I'm in awe of them, like these women and men that I've worked with, some of them, who were great moms and awesome wives and awesome husbands and made it to the Little League game every every weekend, and they were these parents that have turned out these incredible kids. I admire that so much because I just couldn't do that. I never had the mental bandwidth for me personally, and I, I had to go to achieve the level of success I had in that unit. I needed to be all in, and so that made me, kind of a lousy romantic partner. And, um, yeah, I, I definitely have I, – I regret some of, you know, the way I sort of some, – some of my behavior when I was in that unit in the thick of it, um, you know, towards some of the some of the people I dated just because I, you know, um, like I had one with – the woman I was dating at the time, her – it was in the middle of her birthday dinner. And I got a, I had a double in Costa Mesa. I got a call out in the middle of, middle of dinner. And it was like she was a, she was a deputy DA in another county, but it it wasn't even a thought in my head. It's like, hey, sorry, we're I got a roll, you know, we're going like <laughs> take your food to go, you know, and um, you know, there's a few of those that I a few situations like that. Like I I, pro, I I might have been able to wait for her to finish her dinner first, and and I didn't. So there's some, some things like that. And, um, but the you know, truth be told, guys. I, yeah, as twisted as it may sound, I, I miss it every day. I still do. I'm like, I feel like I'm one of those, like those old police dogs that get retired when they're like six or eight, and they've got they got plenty of bark left in them. And I sort of feel like that. I 
I had a I had a shoot recently. Well, I guess about a year now for ABC, and it, somehow they they rented this house to do our film shoot. That I hope they never rent again. And it was in uh, it was in it was in an area of, of of the South Bay that you know it was it was a beautiful home, but it was kind of a rough rough part of town. And as I was leaving, there was a there was some sort of crime scene right down the street, and all the yellow tape was there. I wanted to stop my car and go in. I wanted to play. I wanted to go in and, and help with the warrants. Um, so I, I miss it. I miss it every day. I miss my team. I miss my cops. I miss I miss the mystery of a lot of these murders. I miss putting the puzzle pieces together because it was like living a movie, you know. Um, uh, I don't miss the internal politics of it. I don't miss the stress, and I don't miss the the starvation rations I was getting paid working for Orange County. But um, uh, I, I definitely miss I miss that work. But I'm still practicing law, uh, and I've and I've had a, a great time doing the media aspect of it. It's a lot of fun. And after 17 years in homicide, I was I was definitely ready for a for a change. But yeah, definitely a few regrets. As I say, a few gutter balls, a few strikes. Yeah, I I still miss that job every day. How about the cold cases? Are there any cold cases that still drive you batty, and you just want to solve that one? Uh, oh, there's I got I got more than one. More, more along the lines. Yeah, there's there was a there was a case in Costa Mesa that has always stuck with me. It was a it was a guy who was he was I'll leave his name out of it, but he was you know kind of a, a low rent drug dealer. He was dealing dealing dope, and he got brutally murdered in his house. And that was one of the scenes I went to. And um, you know those guys that that's one where at least so far they they got away with it. And I'm sure it was just your standard kind of dope rip. You know, probably some low life tweaker guys that. Ripped them off for his stash, but I, that's one that has always bothered me. I, and there's a there's a bunch that have always bothered me, but um, that was one where they they did it. And I, I, you know, one day though, if they haven't died because of the lifestyle already, um, they will. That was probably 15 years ago. But you know, there's there's a, a few of those unsolved ones, man. That you, you never forget those scenes. And and then also there's a couple others after I left. There were a couple of my cases that played out. Like I had the Golden State Killer. And uh, yeah, I was the Orange County prosecutor on that, I, and it was a it was a group of, of prosecutors. Each each county where murders happened had their own their own prosecutors involved, and I it was a fantastic team. I mean, that every lawyer involved in that case I was couldn't have been more impressive in my in my mind. He was very active in Sacramento, and you know I I, re, I retired before that one got to trial. Um, after I left, you know they they gave that guy they gave him LWAP or life without possibility of parole. And um, I have infinite respect for Amory Schubert, who was the um, she was the DA in Sacramento. R- wonderful, and as well as the other DAs who were involved in that. But I I disagree with that decision a lot. And I, I I think that that guy should have. I think that that trial should have gone. And there were a lot of really good arguments. There's a million pages in discovery, uh, so it would have taken forever to get that case to trial with all the jurisdictions. But that was one where I respectfully disagree with that call. I wish that. Um, and I think that had I had I stayed in there, I would have. I think I would have been able to prevent that deal, because it was at the end of the day, it was what he wanted. And that guy was a friggin' monster. And I don't think we should have been D'Angelo. in the business of giving him. D'Angelo was one of the worst I ever saw, guys. That was one that was deeply, deeply disturbing. That guy was a friggin' monster. I mean, he is a living poster boy for. And I'm not not just. And this isn't a political thing here, but. Living poster boy for um, why uh, the death penalty is appropriate in certain extreme cases, in my opinion. And that guy should have been a condemned prisoner. He should have been sentenced to death. And knowing full well that it's symbolic in the state of California, nobody will ever be executed here again. But he was so sadistic and so prolific. And I mean, this is a guy who raped a woman in Sacramento. Who, brutally, and he was a knife to the throat, gun to the face, and would use it if they if they fought back kind of guy. He was a, an absolute monster. He raped 67 women that we know of in Sacramento County, J- just the rapes, you know. And but he raped one woman, and she was so terrified, and she wound up going through all the horrific classic rape trauma syndrome, and then she moved because, of course, she couldn't she couldn't stand to live in the same place. He tracked her down in the new location and raped her again. And that that guy, for in my money, you know, um, you know, he deserved he deserved the death penalty. And I, I disagree with that. So there's a, there's a few. That's one that I felt like um, you know it, it wasn't a cold case. It was solved. But that's one that I you know I feel like I could have uh, 
I could have gotten that to the place that it wanted to be, but it would have required me remaining in the office for another for another ten years. You know, and I I done I I I did seventeen years was the longest thing we spent in homicide before me was fifteen, and that that was uh, a guy who spent half of that as a supervisor. So the everybody else lasts around. 12 before they, they get smart and rotate out because of the toll it takes on your personal life. I, I lasted 17 years, so it was time for me to go. But, no, there's a lot of cases that still wake me up in the middle of the night for sure. Yeah, yeah they don't have consultants, so you can be a consultant for the team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, I, and trust me, I, I don't think the elected DA in Orange County would like hearing this, but I got a bunch of buddies still in that unit, and I still talk to them all the time trying to help them. You know, a bunch of younger younger lawyers that I that I trained when I was there. That I'm still I still talk to some of them. I won't say who. <laughs> I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But um, yeah, I, I still uh, I still weigh in every chance I get and try to you know offer any advice I can um, for for people that are doing those cases. So listen, uh, the book of murder. What do you hope the reader takes away from it? Well, uh, what I really hope the reader takes away from it, um, there there really are two things, and that is one. Um, victims really matter, and and that I, I tried to lay that out. Like people that experience, you know, the death of a loved one, the murder of a loved one, it's the worst thing. And it seems like, uh, you know, my fair state of California seems to be forgetting that uh, in sort of modern times. Um, but another thing I, I really hope they, that the reader takes away is that the, behind the scenes, um, I, and I hope I was successful in this. You know, when you when you're the when you're the prosecutor, you're you're the face of the case, and you're standing up there, and you get you get the the cameras, and you get all the accolades when you when you convict a tough one that's got a lot of media. But behind every every prosecutor's up there making a closing argument. There are a couple of dozen hardworking professionals. The the forensic scientists that are out there at three in the morning. The 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 first responders. The the you know the the crime lab personnel that are that are there doing all those tests that just never seem to get their due. And, I, and I, I really hope the reader takes out of the way that there are, for every murder that's committed, you know, where one person has done the worst thing, there are all of these people behind the scenes that are, you know, it's like we've seen, you, you walk into one of those scenes, you see the worst that a human being has to offer, you know, snuffing out the light of life of another person. But right behind that, there are just a platoon of these wonderful people that are there at three in the morning, oftentimes freezing, cold. And I never heard a single complaint. I probably went to 100 crime scenes. I never saw, I never heard a detective or a crime lab personnel utter a single complaint in all my years. So I'm, I'm hoping that the reader takes that away. There, For every bad person there is out there, there are a lot more good ones. And um, that's that's what I hope the takeaway is. I, I hope to, you know, get, get, give credit where credit is due. So let's talk about your social media, website, anything like that. How do you like readers and fans to contact you? Yeah, so uh, number one, I, I teamed up with a local bookstore here in Manhattan Beach. It's a brick and mortar. Uh, it's a local indie called Pages, and I, they've got a bunch of signed copies of the book, uh, pagesofbookstore.com. So that's one way to get a, get a signed copy um, and help, a, help an awesome little local, local independent bookstore. Uh, I can also, uh, anybody can DM me on um, uh, Matt Murphy Law uh, on Instagram. Uh, I do all my own social media. I had none the whole time I was a DA because of all the death threats you get. So I, I have turned into a 13-year-old girl, and I am constantly, <laughs> I'm constantly posting on Instagram, and I'm, I'm, I will respond to a DM. If you send me, track me down, Follow me. I will send you a DM if you got any questions about the book or any of the cases. I, I will engage myself. And then uh, the Audible version of the book is also um, people really seem to like it. It's a mystery to me because I cannot stand the sound of my own voice, but that's doing really well. So um, you know, people can download uh, download the Audible uh, on uh, Audible, which is an, an Amazon thing. Amazon Prime can also it's overnight delivery on the hard copy. But, yeah, otherwise, pagesofbookstore.com. Uh, and try to check out this new Anna Kendrick movie. I, I was blown away at how good this actor was, and she's phenomenal in it, too. It's her directorial debut, uh, and it's called Woman of the Hour, and I think it comes out on Netflix this week. The premiere is this Thursday, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to that. So that'll be a trip for me, my first uh, Hollywood red carpet experience. I'll be, I'm sure, um, you know, in the background holding somebody's, somebody's bag or something. But... Um, but it, I'm looking forward to that. 
Oh, you'll be a star. People will be lined up to see you. It's all good. Fantastic. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> we'll see. We appreciate you coming on the show and, and talking a little bit of crime, you know? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, guys. I, I am a fan of your show. Love it. Um, and I, I need to pay closer attention because I, I actually have your book um, uh, on my shelf. And I, I never can... I never connected the the name to the to this uh, to this interview. So thank you for writing that book. I thought it was I thought it was outstanding. So people should check that out too. That's on Rodney Alcala. Oh, I appreciate that. Appreciate you saying that. And and everyone pick up the book of murder: it's the prosecutor's journey through love and death. Matt Murphy, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Let's speak with you. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.